Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Beth Peterson, and I'm a clinical dietitian at UMass Memorial Medical Center in Massachusetts. And I am here today to talk to you about enteral nutrition modalities. There are four um, recognized modes of feeding. First off, we have continuous feeding, which is just as it sounds. It's when enteral nutrition is provided via pump or gravity drip over the entire day, over 24 hours. Um, then we have cyclic feeding, which is when um, enteral nutrition is provided, again, via a pump or gravity drip, but over less than 24 hours. Primary example that you'll see a lot is when patients are given a 12-hour nocturnal feed. Next up is intermittent feeding. Intermittent feeding is when enteral nutrition is delivered over 20 to 60 minutes. Um, via pump or gravity drip. And it's generally a volume of 240 to 720 mLs um, administered four to six times a day. Bolus feeding similarly is given over a short period, but a shorter period than intermittent feeding, maybe four to 10 minutes. Um, but the big difference is, is no pump is needed. Um, bolus feeding is given via syringe or gravity drip, and generally a volume of 240 to 480 mLs administered three to six times a day. And if you're more of a visual learner, we have a graphic here um, where the light blue color is the hours the patient is being fed, and the dark blue color is um, when the patient is not being fed. So as you can see down the continuum, um, there's less hours the patient is being fed and more time the patient is not being fed. There are, as you can see, the four main modes of feeding. Intermittent feeding and bolus feeding are very similar, as you can see. Um, clinically, in my experience, you're, you're really only going to see three modes of feeding, continuous, cyclic, and bolus feeding. Um, intermittent feeding isn't used very often. Um, so we will kind of delve a bit deeper into those three mo main modes of feeding. Um, so we'll start with continuous feeds and we'll talk a little bit about the advantages of, of continuous feeds. Um, continuous feeds are considered to um, provide the best tolerance. Um, so anybody that you're um, concerned about tolerance being an issue, continuous feeds are likely the mode you're gonna use. Um, and they may also reduce the risk of aspiration because a very small volume of feeding is given at any um, given time. The disadvantages are that a feeding pump is required. Um, as you can imagine, because you're hooked up to the pump 24 hours, it restricts ambulation and mobility. Um, and it also doesn't mimic physiological feeding or eating at all because, um, you know, even me who absolutely loves to eat, I don't eat 24 hours a day, nor does anybody else naturally. So um, that, um, that demands a different kind of metabolic um, demand um, for the patient. Um, when is continuous feeding indicated? Um, generally, you'll see it um, during critical illness. If there's any kind of compromised gastric function, you'll likely see um, continuous feeding and then feeding into the small bowel or intolerance to other feeding methods. Moving on to cyclic feeding, um, the advantages of cyclic feeding, assuming the feeding is cycled at night, is that um, cyclic feeding may help transition patients to oral diet by allowing for normal meals or snacks during the day. So if the patient is being fed 12 hours overnight, that allows them to be off of the, off of the um, feeding during the day and potentially eat normally. Um, it also allows for daytime ambulation. So if a patient is up and about or they are at a rehab facility or they're at home, they can not be hooked up to the pump during the day um, so that they can do their normal activities. Uh, the disadvantages are that you still need a feeding pump. Um, and it also may require high infusion rates, which may compromise tolerance. So for example, if somebody needs um, 55 or 60 uh, milliliters per hour continuously to meet their needs of any given formula, 
to, to provide the same amount of nutrition that um, feeding pump is going to have to run at 110 or 120 milliliters per hour. And some patients may um, have difficulty tolerating that. Um, when is cyclic feeding indicated? Generally, when transitioning from EN, um, from tube feeding to oral diet. So, you know, there's that question, does it potentially enhance appetite during the day? Um, and then if supplemental nutrition is needed to support inadequate oral intake. So if somebody is eating, but perhaps, so they can eat during the day, but perhaps aren't, isn't able to eat enough, we can provide supplemental nutrition support at night. All right. And then finally, bolus feeds. Um, the advantages of bolus feeding. Um, it is the mode of feeding that most mimics physiological feeding or eating. So again, we're bolusing three to six times a day, and that's, you know, just kind of like eating three meals and a couple snacks a day. So it is very similar to um, normal eating patterns. And because of that, it allows greater mobility and it can enhance quality of life. So it's more just like eating meals and, and um, eating like you normally would, um, and potentially can be done when, you know, families are eating at their meal time, which can potentially enhance quality of life. Um, no feeding pump is required, um, which makes it one of the most inexpensive modes or options. And it's more likely that the patient will receive a hundred percent of their prescribed nutrition. As you can imagine, you can give the bolus in a short amount of time, and there's really no reason why it couldn't be done throughout the day, regardless of the other things happening throughout the day. Um, compared with, for example, continuous feeds, you know, at some point, it's likely that that feeding will have to be held for um, a physical therapy or rehab, rehab of some sort, or if the patient needs to take a shower, or if they're critically ill and in the ICU, continuous feeds are likely held for procedures and things like that. Um, whereas with bolus feeding, um, you can generally get all the nutrition in without issue. And the disadvantages of bolus feeding, it um, may increase the risk of aspiration because again, you're giving a big volume of feeding um, all at once. And for the same reason, um, it may be poorly tolerated in some disease states, for example, gastroparesis or really any sort of GI motility disorder. When is it indicated? When a patient has normal gastric function um, and when they're being fed uh, into their stomach. After having said all that, um, I do challenge you to qu question the convention every once in a while. You will probably learn, as I just told you in this, um, in this presentation, that bolus feeds are generally only given into the stomach. So it makes sense. You're giving a big, um, bigger volume of feeding and the stomach is a reservoir. So it's accepted that um, the bolus feeds can really only be tolerated via a gastrostomy tube or a tube into the, into the um, stomach. That said, I encourage you to read this article from pra Practical Gastroenterology because it does question that old convention. Um, and it asks the question, could bolus feeds be tolerated in, into the small bowel? Um, and I'll just give you a, a quick example that I I recently had as a clinician. Um, I had a patient that had a, a feeding jejunostomy place, so a feeding tube into his jejunum. And um, very shortly after the tube was placed, it was found to be kinked in the small bowel. So um, whenever they would, the nurses would try and run the feeding pump, it would always alarm as if the tube was clogging um, and it, the pump wouldn't run. And so, but then when the nurses would go to flush the tube to try and clear out the, the you know, so-called so clog via a syringe, they could push fluid through. Um, so that's when they found through some imaging that the tube was just kinked. 
So the pump wasn't strong enough to get the formula through, but via a syringe or a bolus, we could get the feeding through the pump. Unfortunately, because the, pump, um, the feeding tube was so new, the surgeons or interventional radiology, they weren't willing to manipulate the tube yet. They wanted to wait a couple weeks. Um, so we actually did bolus feeds through the J tube. Uh, luckily, the patient was very small and didn't require a large um, a volume of feeding overall. And we did, um, you know, relatively um, frequently throughout the day, we did some bolus feeds, but that allowed us to still feed the patient without having to resort to parenteral nutrition um, until a couple weeks later, they actually exchanged out the tube and the kink was no longer a problem and the patient did transition to um, nighttime cyclic feeds. But a perfect example of, um, you know, trying something, even though it's generally not accepted to do that practice and and it worked for the time being. Um, the next thing that I wanted you um, to think about is continuous or cyclic feeds. Um, first point being impact on appetite. And there um, are a few studies by this author, Rebecca Stratton, who, you know, the studies are older. They're from the early 2000s um, and they're small studies, but they're interesting because she basically looks at the impact that different modes of feeding have on appetite, including continuous cyclic and bolus feeds. And, um, you know, it's very accepted in our practice today that uh, continuous feeds or cyclic feeds are going to have some sort of impact on appetite. Um, and you'll hear often, oh, we have to change the patient to cyclic feeds or else they're not going to eat during the day. Or, you know, if they're already on cyclic feeds, we have to reduce the amount they're getting through their tube feed because it's impacting their appetite and they're not eating because of that. Um, and these studies by Stratton are interesting because she shows that um, continuous and cyclic feeds actually have very little impact on appetite, but bolus feeds do have the most impact on appetite. And that makes sense, right? Because bolus feeds are very physiological, just like eating a meal. Just uh, ask you to think, think through that and um, you know question that convention. And then the last point is just night versus day feeding and circadian rhythm. So Dr. Doshji is doing some really interesting research, um, and this is just one of his articles here that I've referenced, that um, is looking at the impact of patients getting fed throughout the night. So that would be any patient getting continuous feeds or um, any patient getting cyclic feeds that are happening during the night and the impact that that night feeding has on circadian rhythm, basically our ability to get good sleep. He's shown that it getting fed at night, it's not physiological from, for most of us, um, does have an impact on sleep and potentially on a patient's ability to heal and do well. So, you know, kind of questioning that convention of, well, we always feed, you know, critically ill patients is the perfect example. We always feed them through the night. Should we just be feeding them th throughout the day? Um, so, so some interesting research there. So let's go to a case study now just to display the different modes of um, feeding. Um, so we have a 68-year-old male with past medical history of hypertension and type 2 diabetes who was admitted to the intensive care unit on mechanical ventilation um, following a left MCA ischemic stroke. Um, while he was on the, on the ventilator, um, a nasogastric tube was placed and a tube feeding consult was ordered. Uh, so we have some anthropometrics and some estimated needs. Um, and so the question is, what mode of enteral nutrition would we start most likely in the ICU? And the answer is continuous. You know, again, that convention is being questioned, but I would say, you know, uh, 10, 10 times out of 10, you're probably going to see continuous feeds started in the ICU setting. Um, so we would titrate up to a goal of 55 mLs per hour of a 1.5 kcal per mL formula, which would meet his needs at about 2,000 calories a day. And, um, you know, assuming good um, GI function and good tolerance to the feeds, we could probably start 
um, the new, the uh, feeding at 20 mLs an hour and, you know, increase every four to 20 mLs every four to six hours until we get to that goal of 55. So then the patient is extubated. So he's off the vent now and can potentially eat. Um, a bedside swallowing assessment, um, though, revealed a high risk for aspiration. So a modified barium swallow study was done, and that confirmed significant oropharyngeal dysphagia. So um, the patient was to remain NPO or nothing by mouth. His swallow wasn't safe. So they replaced that NG tube. Um, and then eventually they decided to place a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy or a PEG tube um, so that the patient could um, go to a rehab facility and potentially work on his swallow and but still be fed until he was able to eat on his own. So now he has a gastrostomy tube and he's going to be at a rehab doing physical therapy and doing all kinds of different um, therapies. So the mode of enteral nutrition that makes the most sense is to transition this patient over to bolus feeds. We can titrate up to a goal of 480 mLs or two cartons bolus three times a day. So three times a day, we're going to syringe in two cartons of formula of a 1.5 kcal per ml formula, and that's going to give him a little over 2,000 calories. Um, so you might ask why the random number 480 mls. <laughs> Most commercial tube feeding formula uh, companies, sorry, have um, cartons that are the size of the carton is 237 to 240 mls. Um, and so we do often recommend in a, a, a 240 or 480, maybe one and a half cartons at 360 ml boluses. And that's just to keep it easy for the patient, especially if there's somebody that's going to go home on this and be doing this themselves. Um, so that they can either give themselves one carton or two cartons and not be trying to measure out, you know, one and three eighths carton or something like that. Um, it makes it easier. It reduces waste or reduces the risk of, you know, the patient keeping leftover formula that's already open and, you know, that potentially going bad. So we try to keep it easy using, you know, very simple numbers of cartons. That's why you'll see the 240 or the 480. Just a note, there are some companies I can think of one or two that have different size cartons. So just make sure when you're looking at the um, type of formula that you are prescribing, that you know how much each carton has so that you can prescribe a round number. So this patient, you know, we wouldn't start with a bolus of 480 mLs right off the bat. We would probably start with a bolus of, you know, one carton or 240 mLs and slowly increase them until they get to that goal of two cartons three times a day. And then finally, the patient is readmitted multiple times due to aspiration pneumonia, um, and a decision is made to exchange the gastrostomy tube or the PEG for a gastrojejunostomy feeding tube or a GJ to potentially reduce aspiration risk. So again, one of the potential um, you know, downsides to feeding into the stomach um, with bolus feeds is that it may um, increase the risk for aspiration. So um, you'll sometimes see patients get GJ tubes where the, um, the feeding goes into the jejunum to reduce the aspiration risk. So now that he, um, we're feeding into the small bowel, the patient will be transitioned to cyclic feeding, for example, a 12 hour nighttime feed, um, and to give the same amount of nutrition um, as those bolus feeds that we were giving, we would have to titrate up to a goal of 120 mLs per hour over 12 hours, um, example, 6P to 6 AM um, of that same 1.5 kcal per mL formula, which would provide that 2,000 1,160 calories. And again, we wouldn't start at 120 mLs an hour. We would probably, you know, start at a lower rate and, and titrate up um, so that the patient could um, tolerate that transition. So just in summary, there are three main modes of um, enteral nutrition administration. Continuous, um, you generally think it may improve tolerance and you think of it for critically ill patients. 
Cyclic feeding allows ambulation during the day and is generally used to transition from tube feeding to oral diet. And then finally, bolus feeds are the most physiological and least expensive, and you generally think of them for gastric feeding. I just ask you to remember to question the convention and think outside of the box when it comes to modes of feeding. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.